name is Maria Kravtsova, and I'm editor-in-chief of Art Guide, the web portal on art. I'm happy to welcome you here to Museum Guide broadcast, and I will moderate uh, the discussion on the session museums as uh, opinion leaders in uh, media. I'm happy to present to you our experts. First of all, that is Shannon Darrow, Director of Digital Media, the Museum of uh, Modern Art, uh, the famous MoMA. Dina Sarokina, Director of Boris Yeltsin Museum from Yekaterinburg. Ala Hatyukina, Director of Yaroslavl Art Museum and our guests from one of the most beautiful Russian cities. And that is Pavel Prigara, Director of Menage Central Exhibition Hall from St. Petersburg. First and foremost, I want to say that uh, viewers can ask their questions in comments uh, on the YouTube page of the Vladimir Patanin Foundation and the Museum Guide Forum. And a little bit later, we will answer some of the questions, not all of them. Please bear that in mind. And before we start, with your permission to set the tune of our discussion, I would uh, say some introductory remarks. In the morning, I calculated that uh, I have been in lockdown for 73 days, and I must say that that is new reality, that some of us entered in February, and Russia did so in mid or late March, and it has turned as a shock for many people and institutions. Museums uh, are no exception. But though, starting from the end of March, uh, museums and exhibition halls are shut down, their activities are going on. And that is our first experience, because if it happened uh, 20, 25 years ago, we understand that uh, this would not uh, happen at all. So we are pretty successful today. Museums uh, have to turn digital, to go digital fully and play in the same field with modern mass media, so to say. And they have to abandon formats of uh, tours, excursions, displays, uh, and lectures that they are used to, to formats uh, that are more ordinary for media, interviews uh, and different sketches, uh, different uh, kinds of uh, that uh, content uh, presentation. Museums have to work like that today because uh, their doors are shut physically. And though digital transformation of museums actually started uh, 20 years ago, not yesterday or today, to many museums, this digital transformation in Russia, at least, is pretty traumatic. But it is not uh, connected uh, with the museum as an institution being formed uh, far before the digital era and the era of the internet. And actually, certain difficulties of museum going online are connected with that. But still, we see that cultural institutions that uh, were born in the recent 20 years, they are not facing these difficulties because they have been born in the era of the internet and social media already. So they do not see this all as a challenge like uh, ordinary established museums do. But I don't want, to want our discussion to have uh, a disaster or a catastrophic tone. It is obvious to me that uh, what we call crisis today is not actually so, but it is a catalyst rather of those processes uh, that uh, have been going on for the recent uh, decades, 20, 15 years that I have already mentioned. It's worth mentioning that uh, the activities uh, and events of the recent months uh, actually just uh, boosted the process. And uh, we can say that about uh, museum digital transformation that is uh, inevitable now. And we understand that digital transforms uh, our ideas about museums, our work in museums. and. Uh, Actually, the viewer's experience, the visitor's experience, is now being transformed as well. And in my view, even those museums that today have not yet honed the new digital methods and tools are in the winning position, because actually, museums globally, I'm sure, are 
perceived by population as a competent and trustworthy source of information. And in our era of the so-called post-truth, it means a lot. Museums, unlike many other institutions like mass media, enjoy huge credit of trust and reputation capital from the population. And I believe that that is a great foundation for sustainable development and optimistic look at the future of cultural institutions, museums, among others. Therefore, I would like our present discussion, apart from theoretical dimension, to have also a practical one. I hope we would be able to hear and discuss successful cases of digital transformation of museums that uh, have been expanding their borders to the new reality. And also, I hope that we would be able to talk about separate products, separate, successful, and in demand by the audience. And I would like to discuss today whether the museum having a reputation capital play in the same field as the mass media do, should it uh, perform some functions of mass media? And after the end of the pandemic, uh, should the museum continue playing in that field? And the most important question that I would like to ask today, how in the future these uh, mechanisms uh, can be used? Because we have uh, managed to accumulate a huge uh, experience so how we can use it and the capital to talk about uh, critical questions for sustainable development not only from the perspective of cultural institutions and culture but uh, population as a whole that is uh, our so to say plan maximum and i would like to ask the first question to shannon darrow to ask him to share the valuable experience of uh, his with us and tell us when, how, and uh, under what uh, circumstances uh, MoMA decided to come up with the digital media department and how you came to understanding that uh, you need a separate department for those tasks. And I will explain the essence of my question. I will decipher it. In Russian museums, uh, no one, with uh, some exceptions, has uh, separated digital as a, an outst as a separate uh, development, as a separate department. Now we see a PR specialists working on the digital product uh, and uh, they try to incorporate a scientific uh, workers uh, into that. And it turns out that people do not understand how to do that, how to pack and to come up with these formats, how to implement them. That is why your experience as one of the first museums that has become cognizant of uh, the need of this new, different product, different from what museums uh, were creating before, will be really valuable to us in the format of discussion. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh... Well, thanks for having me. Uh, and I hope everybody out there is safe and healthy. Um, yeah, it's a challenging time. Uh, so the history of the digital media department actually preceded me. I've, I've been at MoMA for a long time, about 15 years. And the department uh, was created, I think, maybe three years, two or three years before I got there. So I can't take any sort of credit in, in, in pioneering the department there, even though I have been kind of a pioneer in it. Um, I think it just signals that a long time ago, like before I was there, that the museum understood the potential. Um, and that's not to say that we have done it uh, perfectly over the last 20 years or so. We've learned a lot, we've made a lot of mistakes, um, but we have had successes too. Um, the department started very small. I think there were a couple people in the beginning and it's grown larger and larger over the course of time. Uh, I think there are, well, there are about 10 people in the department now that focus just on designing and building the website and the app and the uh, information screens in the lobby. So um, that's a fairly large team to focus just on, on, on kind of platform building. Um, what has changed, though, over the course of time, I think, is the, the understanding that digital isn't a separate thing. It's not like... 
uh, you have your museum and then you have like the programs within the museum and your scholarly programs and your publications and your exhibitions. And then you have a website. Um, what has become more apparent over the years is that the, the website or the, your digital platforms are part of that whole thing. In fact, they're a very important part of the, the, um, that mix. Um, in some ways, I think the website is the front door to the museum. It's the first encounter that most, um, most of your visitors will have with the museum. And so it's a very important channel. Um, so I think what has changed over the course of time is that understanding of the, the, the part digital plays in that ecosystem and that it shouldn't be a separate thing. And that uh, this kind of leads to the next part of your question about um, a digital department or not, or why to have a digital department. So I think, you know, in a perfect world, you don't really need departments. Everybody understands exactly what they need when they work together and uh, it's beautifully harmonious and everything works perfectly. That almost never happens or that never happens. I can't, I can't see it. So you probably can use, you know, a certain group of people that have certain competent competencies that are able to champion certain ideas and able to deliver those ideas at the same time. But what you don't want to do is you don't want it to be like as I was saying earlier, you don't want it to be a separate thing. So that's that's the whole the whole challenge with uh, having a digital department, but wanting everybody in the museum to participate in the you know in the experience that that digital department delivers. Um, some places do this better than others, of course, um, but it it is a constant challenge for to get the entire institution to think about how how their work will be represented online or if, if it needs to be um, at the outset as opposed to being an afterthought or thought of as a separate thing. And so this is, you know, something that I think we all think about a lot. Um, I hope that was helpful. No, на самом деле, спасибо большое. Uh, Thank you деле, very much, Shannon. Actually, now, this uh, digital part of uh, the museum represents museum mostly. What uh, conclusions have you made uh, out of the recent two months? What formats are mostly in demand of viewers of the website? Yeah, uh, so I think it, <laughs> that, that's a really good question. And I think the big challenge here is um, what what is going to stay and what what is not going to stay right um so like we're kind of thinking of this uh crisis in three different phases there's the museum closure uh which is like the switch from physical to digital uh we're hoping that this is going to be a short-term thing you know uh, a, a few to several months but it it, it will end uh, and then I'd say the next phase is the phase when we're open, but we're in a world where there isn't a vaccine and there, um, there are going to be many kind of regulations or guidelines or best practices around what that physical experience will be. Um, so that's another phase of, the, of, of, of what we're working on and that this hopefully will be soon. Now we're putting a lot of work into what that visitor experience will be, um, you know, after we open up, which hopefully will be soon. And then there's the, like the long term uh, view, which is what the world is going to look like and what behavior is going to be after there's a vaccine and things return to normal. And I'll put air quotes around that. Um, and what are the behaviors and uh, processes and work streams uh, that will remain? Uh, because you don't want to put too much work into the stuff that is going to evaporate, right? So we can say that there's the 100% digital museum right now, but we're not going to be 100% uh, at a certain point in the future. We're going to, um, you know, have to 
support a physical museum too, and that'll be staged also. And you know, the 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 what what's difficult is you can be a hundred percent digital if you're closed, but once you open and you have to support an opening museum, you can't be a hundred percent digital anymore unless you double the size of those teams, right? So um, you know, it, it's trying to learn from the things you're doing now and, and trying to prioritize the things that you think will be true in the future. And so that's, it's always very difficult to forecast what those are. So in terms of things that, okay, so that's kind of like the overall framework that we're dealing with now. In terms of things that have been successful in this 100% digital uh, space, um, so just a bit of background, we, we were pretty well set up to make this transition because we've done, you know, we've had this digital department for a long time. We have, we sit within um, a team called the creative team, which is a much larger team that focuses on um, content uh, across all channels. Uh, so we have a, a very robust content team that focuses on digital too, in addition to many other channels. Um, so we were pretty well set up there. The other thing is we had just opened the uh, the new museum or like this architectural expansion in late October, just five months ago, which it feels like five years ago. But just five months ago, we completed this massive project, which also involved kind of upgrading everything we were doing, upgrading our website, upgrading our app upgrading all our digital platforms. So we had just gotten through with that, which meant things were in a really solid place. So scaling that for this 100% digital was not easy, but it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't landing, landing something on the moon, let's say. Um, so the things that have been successful so far are a lot of things you would expect. Uh, things like online classes, things like um, content that is related to our exhibition program that allows uh, visitors to get a sense of what's behind those doors, but not packaged in a way that is like constrained by the, um, constrained by the limitations of the physical space. We weren't just trying to recreate, you know, our physical galleries. We were uh, using or repackaging or crafting content that works in, So people don't have to, you know, physically touch anything. Very high percentage of um, online ticketing, maybe, maybe even time ticketing, we'll have to see. But so those are also things that take a lot of work, uh, meaning, you know, the, if you're trying to be 100% digital and you don't have to deal with huge projects like you know, online ticketing and replacing how print materials work in your galleries, then maybe it's a possibility. But when you have to do that too, it gets, becomes much harder. And then after that, the third phase is like, what are those, what are those learnings from things like, you know, magazine, from things like online ticketing that we think are going to, are going to remain true? 
And those are the things that we want to put the most work into. And I think things like those live events online, I think, you know, I think those have performed really successfully and they've really broadened our reach. So I think we'll probably do some of those things, uh, continue to do some of the, those things. But I think overall what we're doing is we're doing a lot of different experiments and seeing what, what resonates. Oh, the last thing I want to say is this 100% digital period has been, um, hasn't been consistent either. What we saw was in the beginning of it, there was a whole, a whole lot of interest in certain things, like a whole lot of interest in like family art making activities, let's say, because people are holed up in their, at their houses looking for ways to entertain their kids in ways that don't involve just cartoons, you know, and, you know, a lot of online classes. But, um, you know, those, some of those things uh, have become less popular now. They're still more popular than they were before, but there was a surge in interest in certain things that has changed. And I think, you know, one thing that's hard to, to do now is rely on, on data because not only are the people you know, the people that you're building the content for, they're going through these enormous changes in their lives too. So um, as things shift along, um, their, th their, their priorities are gonna shift too, your audience's priorities. For example, when things start opening up, when the museum starts opening up, there might be changes in behavior there that were, you know, that, that mean that the learnings that we had from before no longer apply or are no longer, as prominent. So that's just another thing that we're, you know, thinking about too, like what is reliable and what isn't, what is ephemeral and what isn't. Thank you very much. I have the last question to you, a short one. Have you measured your audience? I mean, the audience of the website and is it different from your regular audience that goes physically to the museum in terms of age and other factors. As far as I understand, uh, uh, in Russia, we don't have such research. Did you do such research in your museum? Did you compare your online audience with your physical one? Uh, yeah, well, our online audience is much, much larger um, because it spans, you know, it spans the website, it spans social media. We have, I think, the largest social media following of any museum in the world, which I can't take for credit for. I wish I could, but I can't. Um, and, um, you know, the, the audience is vastly varied. There, it's, it's a massive audience. It's like over 30 million people. So um, in general, it's a little younger. Um, our, 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 well, that depends actually on, but, um, it's, it's a little younger um, and it also depends on the channel. On YouTube, it skews a little more male than female. Um, but I think it, it's really hard to give specifics around it because it, it's a very diverse audience. So in some ways you might say that the online audience is a more diverse audience than our, our physical audience. But yes, we have done research, but it's hard to encapsulate it into um, you know, a few different points just because it's so large. Shannon, thank you very much. And I would now like to ask uh, the same question to our experts. Could you share your experience of online activities over the last two months? And also, could you share with us the conclusions that cultural institutions drew from this situation. First, I'd like to address Dina Sorokina with this question. Could you please speak about your personal experience? I mean, the experience of Yeltsin Center. Yes. Good afternoon, Maria. Good afternoon, colleagues. Thank you very much for having invited me to participate in this session. I don't think that I'm a digital expert. But still, I can share some of our feelings and some of our experience, as well as our best practices. I was very happy to uh, hear comments uh, by Shannon, my ex-colleague from MoMA. I also remember a period 10 years ago when MoMA 
started working in this area very actively. And of course, there was some expansion over various channels, over various types of contact and communication with the audience. But I remember very well one of the comments that actually changed the whole idea of digital museum for me back then, because people still come to the museum to be in the museum. The museum is not a physical space only, that's a space for a dialogue, for a contact, for communication. And quite often, you cannot fully transfer this communication online, but MoMA has good experience of uh, finding such ways, not only in times of a lockdown, but in general. Uh, and also MoMA has uh, the experience of being close to, because that was the case for a while. Um, we were very we were very impatient to see it open, but here, once again, we have a lockdown. As for our museum, the Yeltsin Center, of course, that was um, a blow for us as well. It was not um, a collapse, but it was some stress, and it made us rethink and rebuild the format of our work and of our collaboration with our audience. By the way, we were among the first cultural institutions in Russia that announced their lockdown that was on the 16th of March. And recently, I saw research in Museum Hack magazine. Maybe you know this online resource. The Google search, surprisingly or interestingly, shows the virtual museum tour as maximum for three, four, five days approximately in the same dates, when all museums in Europe, the US, and partly in Russia on the 13th, 17th of March have uh, gone uh, lockdown. And uh, that was the time when uh, our main audience resorted to online sources. And we have also witnessed certain peaks, uh, surges of visitorship to our online resources. Interestingly, dynamics uh, are changing and my colleagues from online department
elements uh, that uh, were in more demand before the lockdown. What it uh, shows, I believe, uh, is that uh, our audience here in Yekaterinburg is uh, very active and uh, they visit us not only as a location of Yeltsin Center, uh, our educational programs, museum, museum concerts and film screening, but also are following our events online. And now this audience uh, has shifted a little bit, shifted to online broadcasting. And the content that we are posting today is uh, in high demand. We can see more views uh, under our videos, naturally depending on uh, the program. There can be from uh, a hundred or several hundreds of viewers to several thousands of views on YouTube. These indicators are pretty large to us because we are not a media channel, we are a cultural institution. We are a presidential center that is pretty young and that has a pretty fresh and young audience, but still that is a process that we are witnessing developing. And what is also obvious is that it has become one of our main activities already. As for what uh, we are also posting apart from the world after the pandemic, we have launched uh, several cycles uh, that uh, were kind of a continuation of uh, the first one, and that is in this or that extent a response to the crisis, and uh, also an opportunity to have a look at the previous experience. We have. Uh, a project that is called a uh, school of survival we launched it long not long ago and we also have uh, parallel cycles virtual 3d tours uh, that uh, were archived earlier and now we can go back to them reconsider them and uh, invite uh, participants and curators of uh, those uh, displays and uh, tours, and uh, that is also huge archives uh, that we have accumulated in the five years of Yeltsin Center, excursions, interviews with visitors, concerts, uh, meetings, all this content uh, is regularly posted on our website and in social media platforms. And what is uh, not clear mostly today is how long it will all last. I believe we are now in a kind of
Я на самом деле хотела бы переадресовать этот вопрос Алии Хатюхиной из Ярославля, и, но с небольшой ремаркой, потому что на самом деле вот эта вот активность мир после пандемии, которая нам представила сейчас Екатеринбурга, This museum, because the uh, Yeltsin Center is not an art museum, it is a museum of political history of Russia, and their activity and their context uh, has uh, these um, interviews of uh, social and political uh, experts uh, very organically. But now we are going to talk about uh, an art museum one of the best in Russia. And we understand that different institutions have very different uh, opportunities, different resource opportunities. And uh, many museums, uh, both federal and municipal, have uh, limited resources. So what I would like to hear from you, Allah, is your experience of uh, digitalization and uh, going online, expanding your borders. And I think Think that you have a shortage of resources you might say that i'm wrong but somehow i guess that uh, and uh, uh, what makes me guess so is the experience of communicating with our regional colleagues so the situation of searching certain unconventional solutions and creative approach to problem solving And I must say that uh, when I visited you, you showed this uh, creative approach from the very beginning to the very end of uh, my visit. So what can you say? Thank you very much uh, for your question. Actually, I must say that regional museums uh, are different uh, from uh, capital museums in terms of funds and resources. Therefore, when priorities weigh very seriously, the investment, uh, what it will take us uh, to go online from offline. That is why it was uh, really critical to hear our distinguished colleague from uh, the US because uh, he said that they think uh, of uh, how to present, to reflect uh, offline uh, events uh, online. And intuitively, we act in the same way. It is a pleasure to me. Talking about online, I would like to say that today, our region has more demand online. And, uh, lockdown proved that but still our opportunities are not and cannot be compared with the large cultural institutional opportunities. Still, I believe that every institution should speak their professional language. If we are not professionals in modern political technologies, I believe we should not touch upon those topics. Therefore, our main area of online activity Is, is that we tried to present this time as an opportunity to show that it uh, can be used to go deeper into the world of art, to use this time to enrich our inner world so that the meeting with uh, art uh, can be more wished, so to say. Proceeding from the experience that we have received, I can say that uh, it's not a conventional event so with virtual tours and uh, virtual narrative, though they have also received their viewers as organized by us in the areas where we had fewer real visitors. So we used this resource to attract attention to less visited uh, museum areas and uh, we are looking forward uh, to the beginning of uh, real work uh, to see how these activities uh, online can uh, have an impact to offline demand so 
it was not that that was most uh, popular, but uh, the dialogues uh, that we initiated on the basis of our works of art uh, from our collection. So we now see we have uh, this hashtag, something is wrong here. And here we can see how well our visitors uh, know the works from our collection and uh, how fast they can find uh, some details that are not uh, characteristic of that work of art. And, uh, this search of new ways, new interpretations is really valuable. Not long ago, our work uh, workers launched uh, the following uh, project as well. We quote something and uh, make uh, the viewers try to think what that implies, what interpretations there might be beyond the obvious ones. The viewers' interest to this uh, product of our museum is uh, really high. And I would also like uh, to share another positive experience, that is uh, the night of the museum. We opted against uh, preliminary prepared video sketches. We decided to show the real museum life uh, at night uh, as it happens without our presence there. So that is a night in the vacant museum when you can join this online broadcast from several cameras and feel one-on-one -on -one with the work of art. This broadcast, the true night in the museum, received the maximum number of positive comments. And it was great to see comments like, uh, we are missing you, we are missing the museum, we are looking forward to visiting you, how beautiful the museum is. And that is uh, actually great because we managed to send uh, this wave of uh, the future that is very expected, the expected meeting of, uh, happy meeting with the collection. So you are looking for the forms of cooperation this is life, this is life communication here and now. And this is a possibility to let people think about how they could transform their lives through communication with art. Ala, I have um, an additional question to you. It's uh, rather a professional question than a question about the communication with audience. Most of my colleagues in Moscow say, we are so tired of Zoom. We cannot communicate through Zoom. It's been Zoom from dawn to dusk. And many, at the same time, many colleagues are saying, we finally won over geography. We have finally found a format in which we could meet each other and see each other more often. Because we often complain that we cannot see each other very often we can only share experience during large forums such as our forum or culturalica forum in saint petersburg but what about personal meetings they are very resourceful don't you agree with that what's your attitude to this new format of communication is it more dynamic for you or as many of our Moscow colleagues, you are very tired of this format. Well, I will not say that we are tired of this. I think that this is a good way to be in professional communication, to continue this communication. These times offer many new subjects and you can choose the subject you are most interested in. I think that for business communication, the format of Zoom is very good and it allows us to see many things here and now. I'm very positive about that. As for intensity level, it's up to everyone to select the intensity level that will suit you. I think that for business communication, it's very good technology. I was not speaking about technology. 
I mean, we are living in a huge country and uh, we are very far from each other. All these formats have been here before the pandemic, but apparently, judging by what my colleagues from regions are saying, people were not using them, although they could have been using them. And the director of Tretyakov Gallery in Samara said that uh, the professional communication has intensified because people understand that they cannot see each other personally, so they are not waiting for this personal meeting to discuss things. They are discussing things and implementing projects online. M many people have been speaking about winning over geography of Russia, finally. Well, I can say that we have been already using these formats. We have already appreciated them. So I cannot say that this pandemic only made us win over geography, but of course it has been an impetus. Well, now I'd like to address Pavel. I am asking you the same question, but with a short comment. Recently, I studied websites of the St. Petersburg museums, and uh, I was a bit sad to see them. The Manesh Central Exhibition Hall has existed for a huge number of years already, of course. The exhibition program was recently reformed, and as far as I understand, you were head of these reforms. From the very beginning, you focused in particular on expanding your activities online. You plan to organize online museum tours and so on. So can you say that you are better prepared for this new reality? At the same time, I'd like to speak about the popular formats. Museums are now testing various formats. Some of them are rejected because perhaps they're not popular. Others are tweaked and um, adjusted and museums are planning to take them to the future. So could you please share your experience? What are the formats you would recommend to use? Which formats are leaders? What to work with to remain a leader as you are? Thank you, Maria, for these questions. Dear colleagues, I'm very happy to be here today. Of course, I heard already several very important ideas about how the situation is developing today, how online formats are becoming part of the museum, how digital formats are becoming part of museums. Maria, I would like to make a small comment on the current situation and I will shift the focus a little bit. Well, of course, we are now living a very dramatic social experiment. And these times haven't really offered any new tools to us. What we are using now are well-known tools that we have already been using before. We have been using some interactive formats and virtual exhibition tools as well. As for communication with the audience, in the beginning we compared virtual museums with media, well, perhaps, but the crucial thing is muse in museums is content. It's key for us to attract our audience by our content. What's important here is that media are often focused on just increasing the audience. But for museums, what matters most is quality. The current experiment is, I believe, uh, a test for both museums but and the audience, and mostly for the audience. Speakers have said 
that in the beginning of the pandemic, there has been increased interest towards online platforms. And now this interest is starting to fade, which is quite natural, I think, because all people are stressed and uh, they try to find some new reality in digital platforms. But most people, including myself, by the way, cannot find uh, an adequate replacement of a physical museum on light and an adequate replacement of physical art that they can see when they are in the real world and in the, the real museum. In that respect, I think that there is a concern that uh, digital platforms might replace real visits to museum and museums must, might lose audience. I disagree with that firmly. I believe that on the contrary, all of that will allow us to expand our audience. And we are waiting, of course, for the opening of our physical halls and we are a bit jealous to cities that can already open their museums. We are following their experience and their practices. And we are trying to evaluate what they do to see whether we can apply it. That pause in the activities of museums and other institutions allowed us to test some new digital formats, although even before the pandemic, we have already been experimenting with digital formats. Before the pandemic and after the pandemic, we have used and we will use digital platforms to have a dialogue with uh, some part of our audience that is far away or for that for other reasons cannot go to our museum that will remain an important part of our activity and uh, in these two months we haven't stopped our operations what's important for us now is to see how the social behavior model has changed and how it will impact the operation of the museums, I mean the physical museums. But we are still optimistic about those changes. And I think that in a year and uh, in a year and a half, we are going to consider this period as something that brought us experience and uh, that allowed us to find new ways of communication with our audience. And uh, this situation will allow us to get some resources. Well, you know, actually, my question was a bit different. I am speaking about formats because museums offer us a lot of formats today. For example, a video tour or an exhibition landing when people try to present a physical exhibition as a digital product. The art of the world after the pandemic is a dialogue on very acute issues and this has been in demand of the audience and i like this format i have been following what yeltsin center is doing or a very nice example of yaroslavl uh, as far as i understand your strategy is to show a painting and you can consider it not just for a couple of seconds as you usually do but for a longer time and you can really scrutinize and study a piece of art so my question is what is the format that is most in demand in your museum which format attracts more audience well digital platforms have been with us for quite a while right, already. I think that the most interesting and the most promising format is 3D models of exhibitions that continue to exist after the exhibition is closed. 
this format allows to choose the way you interact with the audience. It may be a lone walk over a 3D model. It may be a tour. At the same time, we are suggesting not just one kind of a tour, but several kinds of tours. For example, a classical one or a more modern one. I believe that this is a very interesting format because it allows us to get back to the exhibition program to recall some exhibitions that took place in the past and to feel the atmosphere of those exhibitions. We hope, independently of the pandemic, that we will be able to offer our audience uh, yet another way to immerse themselves in the 3D models. I believe that this 3D experience will remain with us and I'm sure that there will be some part of audience that cannot go to the physical museum and that will be happy to go to our museum using 3D glasses and will be happy to feel as though there are, they are in the museum. This is a universal format and uh, it is closely linked to the physical essence of our institution. As for the education courses, of course, they also complement our main activities. And uh, online formats are quite popular among the audience, but I still feel a big difference between physical presence even during a lecture and uh, an online presence when you are in front of your screen. I think that uh, all the audience will get back to the museums and to the conference halls and to the lecture halls because uh, like that they will be able to feel themselves as a part of a bigger world. Actually, we have carried out uh, a short uh, opinion poll before this discussion. And the question we asked uh, on social media of the Vladimir Patanin Foundation is as follows. Have you started watching museum online programs more often during the lockdown? And I can tell you that uh, the results of the poll prove what you have been saying during this hour that uh, people have uh, started uh, to go to social media or museums uh, more often by 20 percent at least and that is a good result in terms of the competition of media formats that we are now witnessing and uh, i would like to continue our discussion now to talk uh, about public uh, demand for expert opinion. How much can museums satisfy this demand today, do you think? Uh, how well do they have expert knowledge obtained, uh, processed, and presented? Should they expand their professional borders to start speaking about something that uh, the people uh, want to hear about and I would like uh, to address Shannon with this question because I believe that uh, people's demand according to what I can see from the American and French press is uh, pretty similar to the demand that uh, modern Russian uh, community shows. Hi. Um, yeah, I mean uh, museums are containers for expert knowledge in a way. I mean, that's that's what they're built upon. Uh, they have their collections and their shows, and their shows and collections are organized and interpreted by the experts that work within them. So I think there's definitely a fit there. Um, I think the what we're challenged with now is you know, a lot of what this talk is about is how to get those um, opinions or that expert knowledge out to the public. And I think, you know, one of the things that we're 
all thinking about now is how that how that knowledge relates to what's going on right now because we're in a very unique moment where where there's a you know kind of a unified interest in what's going on at, at the moment so i think you know the distribution of that knowledge and relating that knowledge to somehow um be helpful or interesting or compelling to the audiences is 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 where we're at and then um, I totally agree with Pavel, which is that we are going to be moving to a physical format soon, uh, you know, in stages and not losing sight of that. So how we're, how we're going to kind of build upon that, that distribution of that expert knowledge into something sustainable that, that um, helps, you know, further the mission of all of our institutions going forward. So yes, in general, I think museums and the, you know, the expert uh, knowledge that they contain is highly relevant now. Um, but as this talk is kind of highlighting, we don't all necessarily know the best way or we, don't ha we aren't equipped to distribute that knowledge or package that knowledge in the best way. Um, like another, you know, we, we are experts also, or we prioritize quality, uh, which, which uh, I heard previously. And the, the, the thing that can be problematic there is that's not necessarily, that doesn't always work perfectly online in terms of that being, you know, uh, what people are there to consume. Um, they want something that is of a high quality, but it but is also accessible, and perhaps a little more entertaining, maybe a little more irreverent or something. But something that makes them want to spend some some of their precious time with with us. So that's kind of the the, the rub in a way. How do you harness that 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 knowledge, but also distribute it and package it in a way that um, does well, performs well on online. Um, and this, cause if we're, if, if we are trying to be, you know, compete or play in the, the larger media world, which, you know, I don't necessarily think is something we need to do in the long run, but it's, it, it's a nice, um, exercise to perform right now. But if we want to do that, then we have to figure out, um, how, how we, best use our strengths in a way that people will actually want to um, experience. Thank you, Shannon. And now I would like uh, to readdress the same question to Dina, but word it differently, because it is obvious that you will answer this question simply yes, because you have a program the world after the pandemic, but I wonder how you came up with this idea, because it is clear that Yekaterinburg is not lacking in expert knowledge, but uh, the Boris Yeltsin Center started competing with pretty powerful media like Ura.ru. So how did you come up with this competition idea and expanding your institutional borders and framework to turn into an expert ground for many social and political and economic matters. I believe that here I have to pay a tribute to my colleagues. You might know, know that Yeltsin Center was convened by people experienced in journalism that in the 1990s were not simply witnesses, but observers of the events. And now having this experience, we are implementing programs that are a natural continuation of our educational programs in Yeltsin Center. And as for how we came up with this idea, it was pretty logical. We managed to implement and launch this project in the first weeks of lockdown. And actually before that, we also carried out online broadcasts and live streams on our YouTube channel. 
But still, naturally, the context that we found ourselves into made us go more actively in that direction. The world after the pandemic is something that does not simply give us a chance to have a look at what we have faced now, invite and engage experts that used to be speakers in our center or that we wanted to be our speakers here in Ekaterinburg. And that is not simply a chance to talk to people that can assess and analyze the current conditions but also I hope that soon it will all end and having transformed and having accumulated this experience and knowledge, we would be able to go to the next stage of our life and work. Thank you. And Pavel, do you have this ambition to turn Menage into the expert ground? Would you like to stay within the borders of conversation about art that you are strong at and that you lead in. We have not thought about that. Truly speaking, we do not want to turn into experts uh, that uh, talk about economic, social and political issues. And I believe that uh, you have to be professional to do that. And museums actually do not create works of art. They focus on their preservation, interpretation, assessment, assessment of those works of art that are created by artists. And within this world, within this artistic space, within this process, what I deem obvious is that the museum has to choose the correct role for themselves. If we see some words of museum expert about politics and economics or social issues not connected with art at all, that would be really strange. But if it stays within art, then Museums turn into experts in associated spheres as well. But that is, again, more about interpretation of what artists create. And to this extent, I do not think that museums will be able to obtain their new essence in the social structure of our society. Thank you. And uh, I would like to ask the last question to all experts from my side, and then we will choose uh, some questions uh, from the audience to ask you to comment on them. So today is uh, the times of experiment on the one hand and expanding our institutional borders, but on the other hand, that is a time to think about the future. That is my opinion. So the question that I would like to ask our distinguished experts is as follows. Do you take into consideration sustainable development goals in your practice. Do you know anything about this concept? And do you think that museums as an institution can and should take upon this responsibility to be an actor to reach sustainable development goals? Shannon, I would like to address this question to you first and then to other colleagues. Um, I think the short answer is yes, of course, we're all looking for a sustainable, a sustainable model uh, for our institutions. It's actually a pretty overriding priority in terms of everything we do. I think if you're building out stuff now, like let's say in response to the pandemic with the um, the idea of becoming a digital museum and you know that you're not going to be able to support it or maintain that initiative going forward, then you might be um, getting yourself into a lot of trouble. Uh, so I think, you know, that's, that's the, that's the whole art 
maybe not the right word, but that's the whole art of this now, which is how do you how do you come up with new programs, inst institute new ideas, um, experiment in a way that will be achievable in the in the long term and ideally contribute to the overall success of the museum. So yes, it's it's something I think about constantly. It's it's the thing that uh, tempers everything we do. Allah, and now I would like to address you because, yes, there is a concept of sustainable development and there is also a very complex concept of culture that on the one hand we borrowed from the Soviet times where culture very often acted as a tool of ideology, let us tell the truth here, and Apart from that, it also had functions of leisure and education. So I believe that now, for us people working in this field in modern Russia, it is critical to reconsider these categories, to understand what the museum per se and uh, culture as a sphere is to our society. And that goes in line with the sustainable development uh, concept and sustainable development goals. Well, yes, we know about the concept. I cannot say that uh, the museum has a well-established document uh, named uh, sustainable development concept, but uh, the fact uh, that we are trying to use some parameters in our activities, that is so. And we see the role of the museum in modern society as that of an institution that influences the quality of people's life a lot. That is true, and museums can change people and society. And now museum is trying to go away from direct stories uh, of education and uh, aggressive actions. We are trying to follow the ideas of uh, people, help them if they are looking at a work of art, help them get uh, maximum information, emotions, experience, impressions, and we believe that those things that we are presenting to our territory, we are saying that you do not know all of the opportunities of the museum. We are telling the audience that they don't know what role can the museum play in their lives. It can be a meeting spot. It can be a place where it's just nice to have a cup of coffee while you are going to work. Our park is a place where a lot of children have been walking throughout their childhood. This is a, an area where there are a lot of country houses. So we are ready to broadcast all of our experience and all of our knowledge to improve the quality of lives of people. This is a place where it should be nice to go with children. This should be a place that could be a symbol for people. And that's also a very important quality of a museum. On the one hand, this is an institution that shows stability. On the other hand, this is the institution that is ready to change. So, of course, this role should increase. And I believe that sustainable development of the society depends in many ways on the sustainability of the approach to the potential of the museum. My last question is to Dina. It is also related to sustainable development and to the expansion of the borders of an institution. We have talked a lot, a lot of things, but some cultural institutions radically expanded their borders. Garage Museum, for example, provided humanitarian aid, so real food for the needy people. How do you think, should a museum act that radically in the social sphere, 
Will it be normal for a museum to act like that in future? Or do you believe that that was an extreme gesture and that was too much for a museum? You know, I think that that's a very relevant subject. It's not something new. We have been speaking about the social roles of the museums for a long time. And perhaps you know that last year at uh, the ICOM level, the International Council of Museum level, the definition change was discussed. The discussion concerned the inclusion of social activities in the activities of a museum. I'm convinced that museums should be socially active. And apart from Garage, I can mention the new project here in Yekaterinburg. It is called Museum of Waste. This is uh, this was first just a non-profit exhibition project, but over the last few months, it has turned into a place where people can uh, come and share some things that they don't need anymore um, or take something that they need. People can leave there some food or some things for those in need and uh, they can come there and take something that they need. Such socially important in initiatives are crucial indeed, and they are going to be an inalienable part of many museums. Last year, our museum organized a creative laboratory with a group of adolescents from 12 to 18 years of age. The result was a multimedia project that was based on thinking about the 17 sustainable development objectives that were adopted by the United Nations and all the United Nations member states. For us, this project was very important as well. We wanted to involve the adolescents. You know that it is always a challenge, but also we just wanted to integrate those ideas and that mission into our activities and into our work. We are considering how our daily actions can show our attitude. It's not just our responsibility or it's not just about sustainable development. It's about social engagement. We wanted to create a platform where new ideas could start from scratch and be implemented. So I think today museums are in a position where they can initiate many things and then implement them. We have five minutes left. And first of all, I would like to comment on, upon one of the comments by our spectators regarding the poll that I voiced. People started um, going to the museum website more to see the products and uh, our spectator said that perhaps a lot of museum community workers answered that and maybe the results are not very relevant but i have data of the museum of moscow from all the social media so the museum of moscow pre prepared a lot of products for the night of the museums and uh, there was 104,000 people who went to the, their websites and social media overnight, and that's a huge number. So my question is, what is more efficient in terms of promotion today, social media or website? What should you focus on when developing strategies for the promotion of museum products? Perhaps Shannon can start and Pavel can continue based on your experience. Uh, yeah, I think uh, it's a combination of the two. I think social media is good for reach and promotion. Um, and it can work by itself. But if you really want to kind of create a thriving ecosystem, then they have to work in concert. Um, and then you can kind of get a virtual virtuous cycle going there. Uh, for example, using social media for that kind of promotional 
touch point that then leads to a deeper engagement on the website is the, to me, the ideal scenario because there are limitations uh, with how much you can, how much you can uh, basically communicate uh, in, in, in social media, that format. Um, so that, that's where I would start. Pavel, how do you work to focus on attracting the audience on the website through social media or do you use social media as a separate channel and as a separate tool? Well, it's difficult for me to add uh, something to the ideal answer by Shannon. We need a balance between social media and website. Maybe social media are more focused on the dynamic audience that needs to get some information fast and the website is uh, a deeper platform, I would say, for more deep engagement and for a deeper analysis and a deeper search of information. So I think that both are intertwined and uh, they are in constant cooperation, they complement each other. I think it's natural. Maybe some new tools will emerge. And uh, here in museums, we are using just platforms that are convenient for the audience. So we are always trying to find a balance. Thank you very much for this discussion. I hope that it has been useful practically. I hope that our colleagues have been listening to us and I hope that they are going to continue some things in their practice. I would like to remind once again that we have discussed today museum as opinion leaders in the media. I am Maria Kravtsova. I'm very grateful to our speakers and I would like to name them once again. We had Shannon Darrow, Director of Digital Media in MoMA Museum of Modern Art in New York. We had Dina Sorokin, the Director of the Boris Yeltsin Museum in Yekaterinburg. I'm very grateful that we had Alla Katuchina, Director of the Yaroslavl Art Museum. And I was also very happy to see virtually once again, Pavel Prugara, Director of Manej Central Exhibition Hall. He actually, in front of our eyes, reformed quite a conservative institution, even an obsolete one, I dare say. So thank you very much for this conversation once again. I hope that it has been useful for your spectators today. Thank you. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.